how much would you estimate is denied to poor people uh, by these illegal and arbitrary practices of welfare? Uh, you, you estimate that the welfare is, uh, pays, I guess, uh, seven billion. Six How much would you estimate is denied to poor people uh, by these illegal and arbitrary practices of welfare deposits? Uh, you, you estimate that the welfare is uh, pays, I guess, uh, seven billion, six, seven billion dollars uh, a year in benefits. Uh, how much would you say is denied uh, by these illegal practices? The research that we've done would suggest that the American public welfare system is only expending half of what it should be expending if it were reaching all of the people who are eligible under existing statutes. So we think welfare costs should probably double. So there should be, peop poor people are being cheated out of another six or seven billion six dollars, or seven a, year billion across dollars a year across the country. Just on minimum standards, just on household furnishings and heavy clothing in New York City, they're being cheated out of 50, 50 million dollars this year, just in that one city. And would you say that the, uh, would you say that uh, we know that residence laws are being knocked down? Uh, the welfare rights movement and the lawyers are challenging uh, man in the house rules and other kinds of requirements restricting. This, I presume, would be uh, additional people who could become eligible uh, for additional money if these were, uh, if these were challenged. Yes, that would, that would raise the cost even more. The testimony before the Prudentials Committee, the FDP had a lineup of very different people. They had Rita Schwerner, the widow of Mickey, who had been killed in Neshoba County. They had Martin Luther King. Everybody knew King. The seating of the delegation from the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party has political and moral significance far beyond the borders of Mississippi or the halls of this convention. But the highlight of the testimony was that of Fannie Lou Hamer. The sharecropper who had been evicted from her plantation had come to s symbolize the Mississippi movement. Mr. Chairman, and to the Credentials Committee. It was the 31st of August in 1962 that 18 of us traveled 26 miles to the county courthouse in Indianola to try to register to become first-class citizens. We was met in Indianola with, by policemen. The president, Lyndon Johnson, he's not <laughs> afraid of uh, Martin Luther King's testimony, he's afraid of Fannie Lou Hamer's testimony. And so he decides that the country should not see her testify live. Johnson is in the White House, and he convened an impromptu press conference. We will return to this scene in Atlantic City, but now we switch to the White House and NBC's Robert Goralski. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. On this day, nine months ago, he did it knowing that they would break away, thinking he might announce who his choice of vice president was going to be. Instead, he gets up there and he announces, get this, he announces that it's nine months to the day since, since Governor Connolly, who was there, was shot along with President Kennedy. So he announced a nine-month anniversary. Everybody's scratching their heads. Thank you very much. And then he leaves. And by that time, Annie Lou Hamer's testimony was over. However, it backfired on Johnson because it became a story that she had been taken off television and in the news that night and for, for days afterwards, they replayed her testimony. I was carried to the county jail and put in the booking room. They left some of the people in the booking room and began to place us in sale. She had Mississippi in her bones. Martin Luther King or the SNCC field secretaries 
they couldn't do what Fannie Lou Hamer did. They couldn't be a sharecropper and express what it meant, right? And that's what Fannie Lou Hamer um, did. And it wasn't too long before three white men came to my cell. One of these men was a state highway patrol. He said, we're going to make you wish you were dead. Welcome once again to the Radical Imagination. I'm your host, Jim Bredos. I'm a sociologist who's taught at John Jay College of Criminal Justice and Yeshiva University here in New York. Amidst the turbulence of the post-war Black movement, a broad-based relief movement burst forth in the early 1960s in response to demands for relief from the many hundreds of thousands and millions suffering from brutalizing economic conditions. A great many Southern Black poor became unemployed and were forced to migrate North from a failing Southern plantation sharecropping economy that had become increasingly automated and mechanized in the 1940s and 1950s. Failing to find jobs in the Northern cities Extreme economic hardship rapidly became pervasive and many became desperate. Many hundreds of thousands who participated in the relief movement were drawn from the very bottom economic rungs of the black community. The movement was neither an integrationist or a nationalistic one, but an authentic expression of the struggle by the black masses in the post-war period for the sheer rights to live and survive. One could also argue that the great rise in relief insurgency was a rebellion by the poor against circumstances that deprived them of both jobs and income. The turbulence also enabled many more poor whites to obtain benefits so that the American lower class as a whole gained from black protests in this period. Just as unemployment groups sprang up during the Great Depression and eventually formed the Workers' Alliance of America, so in the middle 1960s, welfare rights group began to appear and then joined together to form the National Welfare Rights Organization. One person who was responsive to the idea of organizing in the welfare arena was George Wiley, who had been the Congress of Racial Equality's Associate National Director. Wiley eventually became the chief executive of the National Welfare Rights Organization in August of 1967. The strategy behind the organization and the grassroots protest movement of welfare recipients developed from a 1965 paper entitled A Strategy to End Poverty, written by social science scholar activist Richard Cloward and Francis Fox Piven. That strategy argued that mobilizing the unaided poor and inducing hundreds of thousands of families to get on the rolls and demand relief could create a fiscal and political crisis in the cities, encouraging political leaders to federalize the relief system and establish a national minimum income standard. Reverend William Barber and the Contemporary Poor People's Campaign, Struggles for Economic Justice, draws on that important legacy as well. And there are important political and economic lessons to be learned today from those earlier struggles of the National Welfare Rights Movement. We're very, very fortunate to welcome to the Radical Imagination today, Francis Fox Piven, who along with Richard Cloward are widely credited with stimulating the formation of the movement and the organization. George Wiley remarked in an article, Strategy of Crisis and Dialogue, the strategy of Cloward and Piven represented a shot in the arm to a lot of civil rights activists around the country. Substantial changes that have taken place, such as the Civil Rights Act of 64 and Voting Rights Act of 65, have come about as a result of major drives where substantial confrontations have taken place, which have plunged the nation into significant crisis. A crisis strategy has been the only one that has really produced major success in the civil rights movement. That's George Wiley. We're also blessed and honored to have Maya Wiley on the show. She's the daughter of George Wiley and is a prominent civil rights activist in her own right. 
She's a former board chairman of the NYC Civilian Complaint Review Board, founder and president of the Center for Social Inclusion, a national policy strategy organization dedicated to dismantling structural racism, and until recently, an MSNBC legal analyst, a position she left to weigh a run for New York City mayor. So thank you both so very, very much for taking the time out and, and to talk about this movement, the strategy, where, we're, where we've been, where we're trying to head. Um, and this is a unique opportunity to bring Maya together uh, to talk about her thoughts about the movement and her father, and her father's in, uh, involvement in it. And of course, Francis, who has been a longtime uh, strategist and, and movement leader. So I, I thank you so very, very much for appearing on, I think, a very unique and special show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Glad to talk to you both, especially to Maya, who I don't talk to enough. Well, let's yeah, it's lovely to see you. That. Let's rectify that. <laughs> let's, let's first get to the point, Francis, that you make in Poor People's Movement, uh, your book, uh, Richard, that the National Welfare Rights Organization and movement really hasn't had much analysis or, or, or people writing about it or talking about it, yet it was so very, very influential for its time. Why is that not the, why is that the case? And, and, and Maya, tell us also your feelings about that. Well, the, in, in a way, the welfare rights movement was uh, a kind of branch of the civil rights movement. I don't think that poor people, people of color would have found the morale and the courage to rise up on their own. They rose up in tandem with the larger black freedom movement. And it's the black freedom movement that has gotten uh, so much scrutiny. That's one reason, but there's another reason. The welfare rights movement was, in a sense, unique, remarkable, because its political outlook, its demands, its ideology was really different than mainstream American ideology. The civil rights movement was a freedom movement. It, it's probably its premier issue was the right to vote, which of course is very important. But the welfare rights movement was organized around a very different right, the right to income. And that's a right that doesn't have the same sort of majoritarian support in American society. In a sense, it is a much more radical movement, a deviant movement, and a brilliant movement because it raised the life experience and aspirations of impoverished women to a kind of premier place in its ideology and in its actions. I think, you know, look, there, there's so much important to unpack here. And it's such an important history. I completely agree that it's been lost in part because to Francis's point, um, there, the, the, even how we put movements into categories, the welfare rights movement didn't quite fit. Uh, it was absolutely about the confluence of racial justice and economic justice. And it was at the forefront of taking what had been a core promise of the civil rights movement, which is that the economic conditions of black people would get better as a result of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, as a result of the Civil Rights Act of 1965. And, you know, frankly, even Dr. Martin Luther King was, you know, kind of holding back from the fighting around the Voting Rights Act of 1965, even when Johnson was trying to push him in, because he was also from a moral and Christian standpoint, very focused on what was gonna have economic impacts for the black community. And, and actually that's where a point where the 
welfare rights movement and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference was in tension. And the tension really was around the strategy, not of direct action, because that was also part of the civil rights movement, to, to your point, Jim, in your opening, but because of the role of Black women who were receiving welfare benefits, because really for my father, what, was, what he had learned and felt in the civil rights movement, in the Congress on Racial Equality, was that while the movement was so important, it was disconnected too much from the ground and the day-to-day -day experience of black people who were living in inner cities, of black people who were desperately poor. And that he was always very uncomfortable, even as a W.E.B. Du Bois talented 10th. He was always really uncomfortable with that framework. It was not one that he felt good about. It was not one that you know kind of met his personal moral code. So he was always looking for the way to find power and support voice for people who were directly impacted, who were black around economic justice, which was the promise of the civil rights movement, and that they were not to be seen merely as foot soldiers, they, that they should be seen as central to the leadership and the strategy of the disruption of the movement. And so I think when, when, when Richard Cloward and Francis Fox Piven really pushed my father to think is of welfare as the strategy to do that. One of the reasons he so actively and quickly jumped in with both feet was because he saw the opportunity to do economic justice in the black community with black women as the leaders of that movement. And that's a much more, comp you know, we talk about intersectionality today. They were, that was intersectionality before we had a word for it. Yes, yeah, that's right. It's very important that this was a women's movement, a movement of poor black and brown women. And I think a lot of the originality and the radicalism of this movement stemmed from the fact that these were women as well as racial minorities and poor people. But the womanness of the movement inspired a lot of the sort of ideas that that movement advanced that were nowhere to be found in the civil rights movement, actually, because this movement raised, for example, the demand for a guaranteed income, not for low-wage jobs, not for, you know, housing and all of the kinds of sort of the ordinary list that working class male movements raise. But this was a movement of women who were seeking to liberate and advance themselves. And they saw income, income that was assured them apart from wage work. And many of them mm -hmm. said at the time that, you know, they had done a lot of wage work they knew about work and the, the, the movement had given them an opportunity to become something different than domestic servants, for example. It had given them an opportunity to mix with the people in their community, to find a voice, to develop constituencies, to testify to the Congress. And they wanted the, to, to advance an agenda that would build on those experiences and those achievements. Yeah. And, but also, and they were mothers. They wanted to mother. And nurture, right? exactly. They did, and they didn't, really, uh, because they, they wanted, what they wanted, their aspirations were not just as mothers. They, they were a little bit wary of a rights-based movement that depended on motherhood. They, yes. they wanted to be citizens and leaders and community organizers uh, uh, in their own right, even while they were taking care of their kids. Yes, but I think that is exactly my point, which is, you know, this painting of, I mean, black women were not allowed to be mothers to their own children as well as leaders in the community. And that part of the point about having enough money in the welfare check 
was so that they could, I mean, Johnny Tillman is a great example of this. It's, so the wage work, she gets sick. Johnny Tillman was the president of the board of directors of the National Welfare Rights Organization. And part of the reason she was on welfare as a woman who had grown up on a sharecropping plantation, there's no other word for it, had become a, a maid, had moved to a laundromat, always low wage work, always a very strong leader in her own right, gets sick because she has no health care insurance in her work and is in the hospital for a month and comes out. She has kids. She neither, welfare is not paying her enough to take care of her family, but it's also denigrating her for the very fact that we had a wage system with insufficient supports that she could do neither well. And that that was part of the point of a guaranteed income of having enough money Dignity was about, as Francis is pointing, I think it's dignity was about being recognized as a leader as well as being able to care for one's family and that women could do both those things and that a real income that was guaranteed would enable all of that. But I think we forget that so much of the time, what part of how the welfare system was organized was to penalize people for needing it in the first place rather than recognize uh, all the systems that were broken that created the need in the first place. And stigmatizing, stigmatize them stigmatize. also. So one of the questions I had as you both were talking, how did these black women transform themselves into these articulate speakers of what they were going through in the face of such hatred and anger and stigmatization? Well, the transformation had already begun before the welfare rights movement emerged. These were women who had become activists in their community as a result of the opportunities afforded by the Black Freedom Movement, by the Poverty Program, by a little bit later the Model Cities Program. Uh, they were already on the move and the welfare rights movement uh, became a theme that attracted them and which they in turn really elaborated. They gave it a content that it didn't have before they adopted it. Yeah, uh, I think that this, this is so important because there's this great story of, uh, so Richard Cloward had already planted the seed at a meeting uh, that my father attended in Syracuse after he had lost his bid to run the Congress on Racial Equality, and he was looking for the opportunities to do this grassroots organizing that had Black people who were low income as the leaders. And, you know, he, Beulah Saunders, who's a woman, a Black woman on welfare, who became one of the leaders and board members in, in the founding of the organization, was at that meeting. She was part of that leadership already. And, and, and one of the things that my father recognized from what Richard and Francis were saying was there are already a whole bunch of leaders out there. So his view wasn't, I'm helping people find their leadership. His point was, let's recognize that people are already leaders, that these black women are already leaders. And let's recognize that what we need is, is, the, is the formation of the strategy that speaks to them and their leadership and then elevates that leadership, including in the structure of the organization. It was critical to him to, to, to learn from the structure of CORE and actually make these women the board of directors. At that to him was a big part of the innovation of even the model of how the movement was gonna be organized and run and the chapter structure, right? The membership chapter structure so that those leaders were still leading uh, and we're also part of a, a formulating national strategy. But one of my favorite stories is before National Welfare Rights Organization was founded, you know, Sh Sergeant Shriver, you know, was calling this big, who, you know, Equal Opportunities Act, the War on Poverty, was calling this anti-poverty conference, and he was speaking at it. And my father was, before National Welfare Rights, was having been completely uh, uh finding himself in complete agreement with Francis and Richard, Francis and Richard on this idea of, of welfare as the organizing tool, you know, took a bunch of these leaders of these women on welfare to this meeting and they blew it 
up because they challenged Sergeant Shriver and everyone. They said, what poverty alleviation are you even talking about? Because we're still living in poverty. And they just busted up the whole meeting. It blew up the national groups that my father was trying to sell on the idea were like, whoa, because they were already too powerful. They were already too knowledgeable about wasn't working and they were already willing to challenge the powerful to say, you don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> you're not speaking to our experience and we're, we're gonna call you on it. Right. So that it, 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 it wasn't about accepting driver and the policies that put more of the onus of the poverty on these individuals. And that was a crucial <laughs> in uh, collectivizing the protest, right? And moving it forward, a very crucial one. Did did your, so, so Francis, and how did you and Richard work with George? Did, was there um, at the beginning a, a rather smooth relationship? Was it, you know, relationship where you understood each other where we were going um no we had very different ideas of what you did. the movement that we wanted to okay uh, help build of, of what how it could succeed uh richard and i were fastened on the idea of a guaranteed income and we thought that the way to get a guaranteed income was to create so much fiscal and political pressure around the welfare system in the cities and the states that a guaranteed income would emerge as a solution to the screaming problems of the welfare system. Now, the organizers that we attracted called what we what, what Richard and I wanted to do the crisis strategy and they sort of mocked it they said that our strategy was to create a crisis and pray that the outcome of the crisis would be a progressive decent social policy what the organizers wanted and what George wanted too was to create local groups of welfare recipients who would be banded together in state and national structures uh, who would be capable of formulating policies of lobbying of working with the policy makers uh, that was their idea of as a community organizing idea uh, in the 1960s, community organizing was like gold. It was so attractive to the best people, at least. Uh, and George said, because we would talk about it, argue about it, George took the view, well, we can do both. We can create a crisis in the welfare system by building up the roles by demanding full benefits, by demanding full rights. And we can also build this network of welfare rights organizations. Organization is a key word in understanding the difference in our perspectives. So, well, we weren't sure. Uh, how can you be sure? You would be stupid to be sure. We were in uncharted territory. We thought maybe, and certainly, you know, we loved George and we loved the welfare rights movement and we worked constantly. To, we attended all the meetings, we were at all the demonstrations, we raised money. Uh, but there were these two different perspectives on the shape that the movement should take and how it would accomplish what it would accomplish. So in the end, of course, the movement sort of collapsed and it collapsed as the larger black freedom movement collapsed as all the sort of the, the 
insurgencies associated with the Black Freedom Movement uh, withered and crumpled in the 1970s, on, you know, with Nixon as the president, with a very much more conservative Congress, with the Southern strategy of fastening on race as a way to build uh, political support. That was what Nixon did, but it was also what Bill Clinton did. Uh, under those conditions, the movement shriveled. Uh, but the, the, the debate in a way persists, which is the better way, the more effective way to achieve progressive reform. And you, I mean, in a certain sense, you can find it wherever you find insurgency, wherever you find activists, wherever you find people trying to improve their own condition and their, and their society. A, a consensus versus dissensus model, permanent mass organization uh, versus uh, disruption. Is, in, 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 how do you see that? No, I, I don't think that's the, I, I think that's a false dichotomy. And so, okay. it, it, let, me, let me just say. <laughs> Sorry? Well, what I mean by that is, first of all, movements by definition, and I, 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 I do think that if we're really honest about what movements are, they are cyclical. They are movements. Movements are when huge numbers of people get active in something, and and there are institutions that support that. Some of them last between movements. Some of them don't. Uh, I, I have a very hard time not thinking about anything other than the critical importance of the institutions of black movement in this country, whether it was the abolition of slavery, whether it was the second reconstruction, which was the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s, that also led to some of the important economic justice movements like the national welfare rights organizing. But remember that NWRO, the National Welfare Rights Organization, it may have shuttered, but one, the leaders, uh, those women, all went on to do other forms of leadership. And the organizers, who were the professional paid organizers, also then formed ACORN. Uh, so there are all these different ways in which the learnings and the formations of the work continue. And I don't think the measure is, uh, is purely about institution versus not institution. It is about whether or not there's a continuous uh, movement and struggle towards solving what we know is a construct, which is poverty. Poverty has been a constructed reality. It is not a natural occurrence and it can be dismantled and we can't do it in this country unless we face race. Because as Francis just so eloquently said, it's the folks who use race as a tool and racial oppression as a tool, not just to oppress people of color, which is part of it, but also to make sure that people who are white, that they don't actually have to help. And we don't have to restructure society if we just blame people of color. Trump has taken it to a new level or a new low. But I do think that all of the, th the work that has happened, it, it, we, we have to think and understand it in a context that continues the work and the leadership moving forward. Go ahead, friend. Well, I agree with that, but I do think that there are there are periods in history uh, when people are ready to become defiant, when insurgency rises, when yep. elites become alarmed, when institutions are strained and crack and crumble, and those periods are opportunities for significant reform. Uh, yeah. So, and, and it's not exactly continuous. Uh, it's true that the achievements of the welfare rights movement, in a sense, lived on in the biographies of the people that participated in the movement, in, in how the movement transformed their lives and their ideas. That's, of course, true. And, you know, I feel that I myself am a testament to that because I learned a lot from the women in welfare rights. But it's also true that oppositional forces gather and they move in 
and they do as much destruction as they can to the dynamics which make the movement possible. And in the civil rights movement was a grand movement, a great movement, and it was both oppressed and co-opted. Both of those things are also true. And that's partly true of the welfare rights movement too. You think the welfare rights movement was co-opted? To some extent, I think it was. Uh, who, who do you think, co ha, ha, say well, a little bit more about that, Francis. The, well, I, ha I hesitate to say what I'm going to say because it sounds critical and it's not critical, it's so empathetic. The women who came to the fore, uh, who became articulate and spokespersons uh, in the course of the movement were very attracted by this opportunity. They were attracted by the limelight. They were attracted by the paid trips they could take. They were attracted by the kind of money they could finally earn. And this had a taming effect on the movement. There was, I'll tell you, uh, a little story. In New York City, which was uh, the center of the welfare rights movement, because we had so many welfare rights groups in New York, and Beulah was from New York, and Jeanette was from New York. So, well, in New York, and this could only be true in the way that it was in New York, we discovered uh, a kind of tactic to build the movement. The tactic was the special needs campaign. The New state of New York and the city of New York had a handbook, I actually with several volumes, uh, describing how caseworkers should deal with welfare recipients, what welfare recipients were entitled to, a pair of rubbers or galoshes for each kid, a blanket for each kid, a piece of crockery, a knife and a spoon and so forth. This was all laid out in a handbook. So my phone is ringing. I'm gonna just let it ring. At least it wasn't the welfare office. <laughs> so, and anyway, we, we stole the handbooks. The handbooks were not public documents. We stole them. And on the basis of those handbooks, we made up checklists of what families on welfare should have to live a decent life. They should have a blanket. They should have winter coats. So, and these checklists sort of escaped our control. Uh, they spread around the city. Everybody was mimeographing them. And in a sense, the movement developed its own spontaneous strategy. And the strategy was to fill out the checklist, get all your friends to fill out the checklist and move on the welfare center. And it was, it was in a way great because the welfare centers started grinding out checks for recipients so that they could get their winter coats, so that the children uh, could get their pajamas or whatever. And then the, the welfare department figured out what was going on. Because, and, and what happened after that is that the, New York State Department of Welfare changed the arrangements so that instead of the caseworker overseeing the client family and making sure that everybody had a blanket, which they had never done actually, instead of that, everybody got four times a year, they got a modest amount of money to buy these necessities. So, I thought, well, that's a victory. Uh, but 
a lot of the most active women didn't think it was so great because they had benefited more from the campaigns since they were in the, it's always in the mix, so to speak. So I recall clearly a meeting with the welfare rights leaders in New York where they demanded that we figure out something else that would be as rewarding, you know, checks, uh, and that would also build the movement. And the, the strategy we proposed was that welfare recipients spend the rent money in their checks because their apartments were dilapidated, nothing ever got fixed, they could organize a kind of rent strike with the portion of their welfare checks that went for rent. The women who we were talking to did not like this at all because they feared they would lose all, they could get evicted and they would lose all the stuff that they had gotten in the special needs campaign. So, you know, that's, there's, there, there's a kind of ambivalence about leadership and the rewards that you get and when you're a leader. Yeah. But that ambivalence sounds like it was more practical. I mean, I, I guess I'm not clear how not having an organizational structure would have uh, in, enabled the type of strategy and whether in that example that you're sharing, whether that was more about what risks people felt they could take uh, because eviction is real. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a really scary thing, even, um, even in light of having a, a really inadequate apartment. Yes, eviction is a scary thing. And, but it's also the case that uh, the people who become leaders and who do, in a sense, do better with the strategic repertoire of the movement and who get whatever little kinds of money or babysitting money are available through the movement, that they are going to try to cling to those positions and be less willing to undertake the necessarily risky strategies that mm -hmm. an insurgent and disruptive movement has to be able to brave. So we could probably talk about this all day because I think this is a fascinating conversation about uh, what power does, but also how you structure and support movement, which is very hard to do without any form of institutional structures. So, so I hear you and I think that there's a, just like my father was trying to innovate with having women who are on welfare as the board of directors as a way of innovating out of some of the shortcomings of what he saw in the Congress of Racial Equality, which he adored and thought did really important work. Uh, but, but, but what the next levels of challenges to uh, what I think your important point about what it means to have periods in time and history where, they're, where decentralization is part of what makes movement so effective, like people just being able to sit down in lunch counters without anybody organizing or telling them to, right? That's what happened in the civil rights movement Black and how, how that worked. But, but that also there were, it, there were institutional structures that were critical to the protections as well that happened because of that kind of disruption. So I think we need, we need to challenge ourselves on, you're right, the power that can be accumulated by a few uh, who then try to hold on to power, but also that we do need some structures of strategy and protection and support. That's right. So we want, for example, at this particular moment in time, I think it's very important to build up the capacity and it will be in organizations that this capacity uh, rests, the capacity to provide protection, bail, legal help. If the movement is going to continue, Training. it's going, yes, it's going to confront fierce opposition and repression. And to be prepared for that opposition and repression 
we do need organizations. So we need a kind of specialization maybe uh, of functions in the movement. The, the crowd appeals, the mass uh, gatherings, the flamboyant communication, the disruption is not necessarily located in the same people in the same places as the bail money and the lawyers, uh, for example. Where might we bring in our discussion of electoral politics, particularly the role of, let's say, big city uh, mayors at this time, protecting the vulnerable? What, where, where does that uh, enter into the discussion at this moment? Are organizations, uh, movements like Reverend Barber's Poor People's Campaign? Well, I think it's very important that there are, uh, in the Democratic Party, there are politicians who feel a kind of commonness, a co commonality with the movement. And, and they feel that commonality because of overlapping constituencies. Uh, AOC shares a constituency with Black Lives Matter, as does do the other people in the squad, for example. And that's, that's important because it gives the movement a foothold in electoral politics, which it needs A, for protection, mm -hmm. and B, to win, because the victories have to be legislated. Uh, so the, the overlapping and intersections with electoral politics and movement politics are very important and are basically constructive, necessary. And this is altogether different from the point of view that emerged after the 1960s movements in which, you know, all these suddenly wise, wise old men uh, from the movement began to say that there were two alternative paths. One was the movement path and the other was the electoral path and you had to choose one or the other. You don't have to choose one or the other. The movement has to be in electoral politics. It needs electoral politics. And actually those elected politicians desperately need the movement because they're not going to win without it. You agree with that, Maya? And, and the role of big city mayors as well. As yeah. I, and, and they're so needed. They need each yeah. other. Yeah, absolutely. I Look, I think Francis is absolutely right. And uh, we, we have always needed to pull on all the levers of power in order to get the systems change that we need and, and turn, to transform things so that this is a society that works for everyone, not a society that is broken for far too many people. And I, I think that the point of whether it's Congress, the thing about city mayors, uh, we need it at all levels of politics. The thing about city mayors is, and city government in general is, they are the places in government that more directly touches the lives of everyday people, right? That is the level of government. You need all three. You need federal, you need state, you need local. But it is local that is both has the opportunities to innovate the transformation at, that helps elevate it. I think this was to Francis's point about the strategy of creating uh, enough pressure that local politicians would make demands of federal, right? And that that is because local are the ones trying to they're doing a good job, solve the problems, figure out how to transform systems, get agencies of government working in partnership with communities to understand what they are and get them solved. I mean, real anti-poverty programs, if we're thinking comprehensively about them, it's like, how do we do housing? And is it really affordable? And is it really quality? And do people have public transportation that gets them where they need to go? And are, is there childcare? And is it quality? And can people afford it? Those are all questions that local government is constantly, if it's doing a responsive job, struggling with and seeing them as connected. And, you know, Richard's early work, when I was thinking about how some of this started, and Francis, I don't know if you were engaged 
with his thinking yet, but when he actually was looking at why people were going hungry on welfare, uh, and then who was eligible and not even getting it. And even Rudy Giuliani, when he was mayor of New York City, as much as I could say all kinds of negative things about him, he did understand that it was better for the city if it figures out how to get everyone on food stamps that was entitled to food stamps and how to get everyone on Medicaid that was entitled to Medicaid. And, and we probably won't see that Rudy Giuliani today, but that's my point is that's actually what city government tries to do and then starts to elevate and, and fight about when it, so the responsiveness of a New York city mayor of any city mayor to not just a traditional politics of machine politics, but actually responsive to what people who are directly impacted by the problem are saying the problem is and able to say what's going to work or not work. And I think that was part of the power of the lessons that I learned even as a young kid, you know, sitting at the feet of these giants who are women on welfare, was they actually knew what wasn't going to work for them. And they could tell you what was wrong with the programs. And they could tell you exactly what would make life different. And, and, and that's the thing that political leaders have to look at and hear and actually work in partnership with to make it work right. So I think there's a huge role. In just the, the few minutes we have remaining, I, I, I'd like to just perhaps end on, on uh, asking you this question. What's your feelings about the counter movements? We hear today that two people were killed uh, protesting mm -hmm. Wisconsin by armed militia, uh, the threat of, of a, a real neo-fascist takeover. What are some of your, as a counter movement, what are your, some of your ideas and feelings about that and resistance to that? Well, I think that the counter movements, for one thing, they have always been with us. Uh, there have always been right-wing racist uh, movements in the United States, and they have emerged more powerfully when they're encouraged by those in power in office. You would not have uh, the kind of fascistic street movements that we now see without Donald Trump, without his encouragement and without his, his gangs, gangs that are military personnel from the federal government. That's who's composing those gangs. Uh, so uh, you can't, but in the United States, you can't avoid that. I worry more about those who say, you know, let's not do anything. Let's, let's in a way stay quiet. Let's stir Let us, the yeah. opposition. Uh, I worry more about that kind of reaction than I do about the conflagration <laughs> itself. I think that we are going to see in the next few weeks after the election, uh, we are likely to see a kind of upsurge of street action, street violence, such as we have not seen for a long time in the United States. I think it's very important that our movements be part of that street action. I don't think we should evacuate and leave the fascists in, in charge. In just a minute, we have Maya. Would you like to also respond? Yeah, you know the key, the key to protecting a democracy that is still in need of building is to exercise that exactly what Francis is talking about. We have to be in the street. We have to be in it with peacefully, with purpose, and not be afraid. And that's really the lesson of the civil rights movement as well. Was and John Lewis himself with good trouble is confront it and don't don't shy away from the good trouble and it now more than ever just like we saw with those moms in Portland who you know made a barrier line when we saw the awful federal action that was nothing short of fascist and completely unnecessary so I, I I see that organizing happening I see people talking about how we protect our democracy and I see how multiracial it is and that gives me tremendous hope and my feet will be in that street too great and as
Reverend Barber would put it, stand in that breach. So it's a moral issue as well. Listen, this has been fascinating. Thank you so very, very much. Really loved hearing from you both. Thank you. And hopefully we'll get a chance to do this at, at some later point as well, too. And all the best. And, and thank you again very, very much. for. Thank you, Jim. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Jim and Francis. <laughs> if I'm... And thank you so very, very much for watching us this week on The Radical Imagination. We'll see you again next week. Thank you again. Thank you.